Great. Welcome to a very special panel, one I've been looking forward to. Um, the Kick-Ass Anniversary, Toyama Press Turns 10. And this is all about um, celebrating and exploring the history of Koyama Press with uh, the publisher and founder, Annie Koyama, uh, along with several of the artists she has published, um, both very recently and uh, back to the very beginning as well. And uh, I'll go ahead and just introduce everyone very quickly. And um, I have a few questions to ask, but I also hope to make this kind of encourage kind of free-flowing conversation among all of you with regards to sort of the things I'm, gonna, I'm going to discuss. Um, all right, so immediately to my left, of course, is Annie. Uh, to her left is uh, Patrick Kyle. No, that would be Ben Sears. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Look, one down. My, my apologies. This is bright lights. Ben Sears. Yeah. Most recent book is uh, Volcano Trash. Uh, then Patrick Kyle's most recent book is Everywhere Disappeared, and I believe they're both debuts at this show. Mm -hmm. uh, then Eleanor Davis, uh, her most recent book from the spring, You, a Bike, and a Road. Then um, from uh, the Old North State, uh, Dustin Harbin. Uh, his most recent book for Annie was uh, Diary Comics, I believe. Yes. And then at the very end is Hannah K. Lee, another debut with the show, Language Barrier. Um, so all these books uh, will be at her table and uh, the artists as well. And um, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, I imagine a lot of people at this panel are familiar with Annie's story um, in terms of how she got into publishing. So I'm going to sort of ask some of the little more specific questions, um, and in particular, uh, sort of going over the years, one thing I'm curious about is, as a publisher, what kind of books, what, what do you look for, what catches your eye, and in particular, how has that evolved over the years? Well, I'm a visual person, so I've always looked at the art first, but um, you can look at beautiful art books and there's not much story there, or, you know, I think how it's evolved is I look more for the writing as well near the beginning. But I will say that if the art turns me off, it's not going to happen no matter how strong the story is. It, it, it's not a bad book. It's just not for me. So if I can't be behind something 100% because I have to sell it for many years, and I have to and want to love it until the end, until the last book sells, uh, I can't fake it very well. So <laughs> I, I want to love it. Yeah, and so um, I have turned down stuff that, you know, do I have regrets? Maybe a little twinge because I liked it very, very much, but I think in the end I was pretty instinctively correct not to take on a few of those books, even though they would have sold a ton. And they did go to other publishers and I'm happy for them and they sold a ton for those people and I'm happy for the artist, but um, it still wouldn't have worked for me. So that's the extent and that hasn't changed. My accountant wishes that had changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it kind of leads to the next question is that, you know, it sounds like you have this gut aesthetic reaction to it. Like, do I love this? Has there ever been a book that you turned down because you thought, there's no way I can sell this, even though you loved it? No, if I love it, I'm prepared to work my butt off mm -hmm. uh, day and night to do it. So no, that's never a thing for me. If I love it, I feel, if I've got the passion for it, and I've been proven right every single time, there is a batch of people who will also come to love it. They just don't know about it. They might not know how to look at something yet. And so, you know, introducing you to uh, Antigone by Connor Williamson, you, some people may know him from mainstream comics and that kind of thing, but uh, it's so beyond the pale. You're not gonna see a book like that, and you don't know it until you pick it up. So it's a harder job for me to introduce that than something that speaks for itself and I don't have to explain it to you and I don't have to be in a bookstore with you when you pick it up. Uh, it's a harder sell because I'm not in a bookstore with you if you see it blind and you've never heard of him nor Koyama Press. But the discovery part is pretty fantastic because I feel like a lot of people will discover it the way I discovered his work, particularly that one story. So yeah, I have faith. Blind faith sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the counter, counter to that is, do you ever have any regrets over anything you've published? Not that you'd have to like call oh, it out, but. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I know I've taken books on knowing full well that I might sell 500. Uh, that's not a lot of copies. That, to be honest with a lot of 
color books particularly, they won't even pay back your printing costs. It won't pay your shipping costs. It's an insane, stupid business decision <laughs> to take. But I know that going in, and my mandate is to work mostly with emerging people. How else are these people going to get a break? Um, I bet Solinger didn't sell 500 copies of his first book when it came out. So I, I'm not, if it was all about the sales, I would have been gone a long time ago. Um, obviously, when my own money ran out a few years ago, I had to pay more attention. But if I ever, I've always said to Ed, who works with me, and anybody who will listen, if I ever have to take a book on because I know it'll sell a shit ton, but that I don't love it, I'm done. So, and I've had those books come across my desk and not taken them. So, and I'm glad, you know, Fanta has, or Dan Q has, but, and I'm happy for that artist, but it still wasn't right for me, so. Um, bank account low. That actually leads to something where I'm gonna open it up with the artists as well, is that, you mentioned that you really like working with emerging artists. And uh, I'm kind of curious about how that relationship works, because I've always thought of you as someone who's really nurturing with young artists in their career. And uh, I'm interested in, um, in particular, your working relationship. Are you the sort of publisher who's like, if you see someone and you have faith in them, you just let them go and you don't edit them or do anything at all? Or do you like give advice or does it depend on the artist when they, what they need from you? I will take a chance on anyone I believe in, and um, it's a collaborative thing. Some people don't want to be edited, but I mean, after all these years, I know that a cover is really important, whereas in the early days, it's like, Michael DeForge, you know, can you write a little bit bigger? You can't even read, lose. <laughs> and then he revised it, and it's like, I still can't see it. And sometimes <laughs> I can't see it, and you know, it's right here. Nobody can see that. So uh, some people are open to and want a ton of editing. If you want a ton of editing and you want like a real editor, I don't pretend that that's me. That isn't me. It's not my strength. I'm, intuitively pretty good but you're at the wrong house and so I have had people come to me with that and uh, if it's a little bit too much you know Kyla Roberts with whom I work she asks for quite a lot but I'm comfortable and we do it together and she they have to go away happy um, so and then who needs to edit Eleanor Davis I mean right <laughs> so the, I mean there's the I know and um, you know Ben will maybe just you know, ask him to shorten something or maybe some, lengthen something. Patrick, I never have to edit. So it, every stuff. single yeah, well, we, no <laughs> copy edit. I'm talking Lots about like this. the other kind of editing. No, we're Nazi like about uh, copy editing. <laughs> you know, that's one thing I learned, as you all know. Yeah. So yeah. after one big mistake, but um, yeah, no, no, the other kind of editing. It depends on the person. But if you come to me and you want, you want to be walked through the whole thing. I'm going to send you to first second or somewhere who will do that and who have people on staff who do that and do it better than I. So I'd like to go down and um, through teach the artists and sort of ask about this um, about this question about um, your relationship with Annie in terms of being a new artist and have often having your very first book published by her. What the relationship was like, um, uh, how the editing process felt for you, sort of along those lines. And let's, let's go ahead and start. Um, I don't know. It's nice because she's like more of a friend than anything else. So you don't feel like there's a weird wall of like communication where you have to be professional or anything. I mean, it helps to be <laughs> professional. But like, you know, you don't have to have like a business email thing. It's just like can be a couple lines. Um, or and, hopefully don't have to be afraid to ask me yeah, something. exactly. And be intimidated. And as far as the editing goes, like, it's, I feel like if she trusts you enough to publish your book to begin with, like, the editing is not super invasive. It's just, like, suggestions, like, oh, put some action here, or, like, make this longer, shorter. I don't know. Do you often, do you seek out advice like that, or do you just find that she sees things in your work that you hadn't quite seen or thought about that made it better? Um, a little bit of both, because when you're working on something that you're writing and drawing, like, you're just so close to it all the time, you don't really step back to see if it actually works. So having her to just kind of bounce back and forth is good. Um, and, and Patrick in particular, I'm curious about how you came to work with, uh, with Annie, and your work is um, so singular and interesting and, and iconoclastic. Uh, what it felt like to work with a publisher who got you and let you just go in whatever direction you wanted? Um, 
It was it was like really natural. Like we've been working together for like almost a decade. I mean, pretty much since Guayama Press started. Like the first um, two books I did with Annie were um, no, we did th we did three. I guess three issues of um, or well, not three issues of Why We Zonk, but there was two issues of Why We Zonk, and then one issue um, that was like a collection of illustration work, which was I think our first book. It was called Pobody's Po-Bodies Nerfic, and Why We Zonk is a group that um, I formed in in university that was myself and my partner Jeanette Lapalme and our friend uh, Chris Kuzma. And we were like sort of an illustration collective initially and our first book was just a collection of illustrations and at the same time we, we were self-publishing this um, anthology called Wowie Zonk that was just um, Toronto artists who were work, working in sort of like an avant-garde approach to comics. Um, and Annie just, I guess, just saw what we were doing and, and saw that we were very motivated and um, and then put out the third issue of that series. So it's just sort of just, I don't know, you've kind of just trusted me to do what I do <laughs> since then. Um, How did it feel to be a cartoonist who was a self-publisher to have not to worry about those aspects with someone who really knew what they were doing? How did that free you up creatively and otherwise? Um, I, I really approach it um, in, in much the same way. I don't really think about like self-publishing and bigger publishing projects. I don't really like. Um, I, I think maybe I'm I'm considering an audience a little bit more than I in some of my self-published work. I'm not too concerned about like holding anyone's hand or um, making work that's highly readable, but. Um, when we did um, Don't Come In Here last year, that was one that I wanted to be a little more um, accessible to more people. So I kind of like departed from my more abstract approach and went with like a more paneled approach. Um, so I guess I, I am making a bit of a distinction now, but yeah. Eleanor, you've worked with just about every kind of publisher there is, from like major presses, small presses, um, how did your um, experience with Annie differ from those others, and uh, why did you seek out her in particular to publish this particular book? Um, <clears throat> well, I had, uh, uh, it's, my book is a travelogue. I was on a bike trip um, from Arizona to uh, I biked to Mississippi, and I was drawing along the way and posting the um, drawings on Instagram and Twitter, and. I was planning, at first I wasn't planning on putting it out, out at all, uh, and then I thought, well, I'm not productive enough to make all this work and not publish it somehow. <laughs> uh, so I was going to put it out as minis, but then it was over 100 pages, and I was kind of distressed about it. Was <laughs> like I, it wasn't supposed to be a book. It was supposed to be something very transient. And, um, and I had always wanted to work with Annie because she's wonderful, <laughs> and because of all her all the books she publishes are wonderful. And I felt like it would be a really good, uh, Annie's books, Koyama Press books are always very like um, personal uh, in this very certain way. There's a, a heart to them. So I, I felt that it was a good home for this sort of funny little travelogue book. So I just reached out and asked her. And of course, it's wonderful working with her. There's not much more to say about it than that. She's just the best, <laughs> the best person. And how did you react when you saw Eleanor wanted to pitch that book? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, well my mandate is mostly emerging people because I feel they need a step up way more. Um, obviously I'm not averse to working with people like Eleanor and Julia Wirtz and mm -hmm. Renee French. Um, you'd be insane to turn them down. but. You know, what if I had not loved this book from Eleanor? It would have been the same story that I would have, you know, sent her maybe somewhere else, but I felt that I could do it justice. And I think we have so far, and I love it to death. Uh, of course, when I get these books, it's a few years, sometimes five or more years before you guys actually see the book. And so at that time, um, I wanted to go into criminology. That was one thing that I was, uh, that was a path I took out of college. I don't know what I was thinking, but I've always <laughs> been, um, you know, sort of for the underdog and the part in that story, if you read the book about the border crossings and the helicopter stuff, that really hits home as 
a person of color, you know, with all the stuff that's going on in the world. And if you're, a, you know, a lefty from way back, that stuff really stings because it's like, it shouldn't be better by now, but no, it's, it's sort of worse by now. Mm -hmm. So that hit home and that grabbed me alone. I had watched the um, pages come up on Instagram while Eleanor was writing and loved it so much, but sort of never dreamed that, you know, I would be doing that book. So over the moon, what can I say? To this day, I'm over the moon. Uh, people compliment this year, particularly for the lineup. And I have to say, I mean, anybody who has an Eleanor Davis book is going to have a great lineup that year. So I'm super <laughs> grateful and honored. And she's lovely to work with. So, yeah. You'd be nuts not to. Um, uh, Dusty, yeah. Annie started publishing your mini comics a long time ago. How did, uh, how, how did you get in touch with her? You know, we're, we're both North Carolina folk. And uh, how, how did... Uh, how did the North Carolina Toronto connection happen? I was at TCAF in 2009, and this lady came up. Some lady. Not wearing, lady wearing in her uniform down there. Some lady. <laughs> <laughs> and she walks up Same to the table and she's, she's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> she's like, oh, this is all really good. This is, oh, I like this. Can I have one of uh, everything? <laughs> And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is great. I'm really blowing up in Canada. <laughs> she emailed me later, and a few months later, and was like, have you ever thought about, um, about uh, publishing something? And I think it was, I think you'd already done Lose One, and maybe the, uh, what's it called, v Wonder, the um, black and white? You'd done, like, a, a few things. Done a batch of zines and the Craftwork comic by Chris Hutzel. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking yeah. of, Craftwork comic. I don't know what the wonder part was. Anyway, she um, met me through TCAF and then just reached out to me and then immediately was at my disposal, just like, what do you, how do you want to do accent. this, how do you want to do that? <laughs> uh, it was great. Um, the, um, but I, at the time, was already, I was a young cartoonist. Let's see, that was 2009. So it was, what, eight years ago, and I'd been making comics for like two years, I think. But I was an old person compared to the other. <laughs> like, I was tabling that year with Joe Lambert and the CCS guys, Chuck Forsman. So they're all, like, in their early 20s at this point. Ballers already, just, like, cranking out really great work. And I was 10 years older than all of them and had been in comics already at that point for probably almost 15 years as a clerk and a manager and a convention organizer and was brand new to, like, being at shows, so Annie was the first person that expressed like, well, no, Chris Pitzer had as well. I'd had a story in a Chris Pitzer thing, he'd been very supportive. But Annie, in Annie's way, and I think all the people at this table would, would back me up with uh, the thing that she does is very Annie and very like, incredibly supportive and warm and trusting and uh, as much a patron as a publisher. Never, never talks about money or sales or any of that. Never is like, I think we could sell more if we do this. I don't think I've ever heard those words come out of my mouth, but very much about like, how are you, the quality of your work, the, your life as an artist, it's, it's great, pretty good. It's all right, I'd do it again. <laughs> 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 Would do again. Um, how did that support, especially as a young artist, mean to you in giving you confidence, and in particular with your diary comics, you know, over the special last few years in particular, you've gone to some really new brave, tough places in what you're discussing as opposed to some of your earlier work, which is a little, a little sillier. Right. The, how much did that, that confidence like, allow you to do that? Um, gosh, I wonder if it has anything to do with it. Annie's so trusting that I can't imagine her. She was just as pumped about the dumb early diary comics that were like, I made a sandwich using sriracha instead of pickles <laughs> today. Um, was very uh, supportive of that, and and as I started doing more comics about uh, depression and like getting more and more honest with them, um, if anything, I mean, she just is better all the time. But uh, I feel like I could make as long as I think I think Annie says that she's really into the work, but I think Annie's really into the people. I think Annie picks people. And then what the people want to do, not to gainsay you, but 
the, I suspect that Annie would have a hard time picking a person and if they did the work that she wasn't as pumped about, um, I'd be surprised if she passed on it because it's the people that she's investing in and you feel very invested in. So I never had a problem with confidence. I never was like, I hope Annie will like these. If anything, I know Annie um, um, knows just as much about depression and darkness as I do and will maybe respond to it as an audience member more than a, as a publisher, but it's more about, I do feel um, trusted and held by her um, as a friend and as a uh, publisher. So maybe that's a level of confidence, like uh, I have this woman's attention, uh, whose attention I crave, and that, that's a good thing as an artist to, to, um, to uh, want uh, that from your publisher, as opposed to I hope I can find some dummy to print this. You know. <laughs> um, so yeah. Thanks. And uh, Hannah, um, you're on um, one of the most recent editions. Yeah. Um, what brought you to, because uh, you've been doing zines for quite a while. Yes. Um, what brought you to Annie's attention? Did you go after her? Did she seek you out? Um, Annie bought two of my zines. Uh, it, it was called Shoes Over Bills. It was a bunch of lettering experiments, and she just bought them online. How did you find me, Annie? I don't know. Did the internet? Maybe a blog? I, th I think so. That shoe, that's still one of my favorite things ever. Thank you. Yeah. I, we have lots of friends in common, too, though. Mm -hmm. So I, Partly, when I think about it, I'm like, did we do karaoke together? I don't remember yes. first. And then, no, but I know I talked to you like a long time ago. Yeah. I've liked your work for a long time, but you have too many day jobs, and I figure, She's never going to have yeah. time to put a book together. But I did the, after five years. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. So it's worth waiting for. Yeah. yeah it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I, Annie, after um, seeing that zine, which is on the screen right now, she checked in with me about once a year to ask if I was ready to do a book yet. And, you know, finally, after five times, I was. Um, so, yeah, she was just amazing and patient and um, trusting, as everyone has been saying. Um, so yeah, that's how uh, Annie became acquainted with me and my work. As a zine maker, had the idea of being published been something that you've been thinking about? Or? No, no. Um, also, uh, something I'm a little neurotic about is a lot of my friends are cartoonists, but I don't specifically identify as one. I think the work that I make, especially the zines, are more um, like art books. And the book does contain some comics, but it's mostly um, art books and other work in that vein. Um, but yeah, here I am. Um, Annie pushed me to make a book and I listened to her because you should do what she says <laughs> all the time. <laughs> uh, it's, that's a funny point because Annie is someone who always offers um, advice and help um, in a very behind the scenes way. and. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Jenny's generosity is well known throughout the industry. And something Annie brought up with me is that there are different kinds of generosity. And um, uh, can we kind of ex explore that? Because it's like, you think of generosity, you think money. But money is like a very brief, yeah. transitory thing. And what you invest seems to be far greater. And I'm curious about in terms of, in giving that kind of just generosity, what do you feel like you get back from those relationships? I don't want anything back, but um, what many of you may not know is I can only publish 10, 12, maybe 13 books a year, but I want to work with 50,000 of you every year. I just don't have the time, but you, I feel like, you know, I see some of you. Um, I've helped you in different ways, getting people to shows, um, you name it, printing your stuff for you, but not just newbies. Um, if you look around the community, I, I want a better, stronger community that um, broadens everybody's readership. I feel like the one thing that we can't control much of is to grow our market. And there's so much talent and there's so much good work to be had, but we can just keep putting it out into the void unless we can find people to buy it because it deserves to be bought. And so I do help a lot of people behind the scenes with my own funds because, uh, you know, the small press doesn't make lots. So it's not actually from the company, but it's from myself. I do as much as I can because I want to grow the whole community. And I think that it sounds daunting to say that, but after 10 years, 
you can help a lot of people, not with a ton of money. You can help them in different ways. But I, I, when people say, oh, you're so generous, and I'm like, I know what they mean. They mean, like, you gave somebody money to print their zine because they couldn't afford it. And that's, yes, and that's, like, lots of value. But I realize that most people don't have that or don't choose to sp spend, you know, their disposable income that way. But you can boost another artist. You can go around showing one of our books. You can go to the library if you can't afford it. You can talk up a friend who's good, but not bullshit. I mean, you have to like their work. If you honestly like it and then boost their work, how are you not helping the community? You're helping them. You might say it to the right person. They may, oh, my brother's a publisher. And by the way, you know, why don't I show it to him? So if people just stay quiet about everyone's work, we, we don't expand much. If you all get noisy about it, but you know, genuinely interested and noisy, um, sincerely, then I feel like just slowly, you know, we can make it a little bit better. I really believe that. It sounds corny. <laughs> it's it's totally genuine, and and, well. it, it's, and along those lines, um, wanting to change the industry and expand. Um, what changes have you seen in the industry in the last ten years, and? Um, that, uh, and that in particular may be linked a little bit toward what you're doing. And um, what have you changed, as, how have you changed as a publisher during that time? Not just in the, terms of the kinds of books you publish, but just overall. I'm, I mean, I can't take credit for any other publisher, but I feel like during my time, more people have decided to see what I've done and decided to take a risk. They may not be able to spend as much money as I did initially on wildly taking risks, that stuff, and not giving a shit if you don't sell 200 copies of something. It was more important, it always will be more important for me to have you know that Ben Sears is out there in Kentucky working his butt off for very little money, but making a wonderful, wonderful uh, book for you. Um, otherwise, you might not know about him. Someone hopefully would pick him up if I wasn't here tomorrow, but um, I feel like 2D Cloud, there's, you know, Uncivilized, there's all other small presses who, um, they can't afford to take those risks. It's, it's a huge risk to print a book and not pay back your printing um, charges alone, let alone ever pay yourself as a publisher. Um, so I think I'm hoping, while well, not taking credit for that, I'm hoping that I've seen the community grow that way and I think it's a really nice thing. Um, I'm very anti-Amazon, even though I feel like I'm biting the hand that, you know, feeds me, sort of, and feeds our artist. I would always rather you keep a bookseller open, but I understand if you don't live near a comic shop or a bookshop and you don't have very much money, um, you know, why would you not buy it cheaper on Amazon? I get it, I, and I would never criticize anyone. I would rather you have the book that way, but I also feel like, you know, big picture-wise, they're they're into everything they everything they sell is they're taking away from something else so i'm sorry for the leftist grant here but just <laughs> give, give me a second it's just um and i know it's convenient and i mean have i bought anything on amazon over the years yes i have i couldn't get it from someone and so i did it i try not to do it often so i'm not that person who's saying you know i would never do that shit i have and i might do it again but just long picture, there's damage. There's damage to all of us. You know, your publisher may not be around if they're a small publisher. I think there was going to be long-term damage from it. Uh, monopolies in general tend to be problematic. And anyway, I'm going to stop preaching. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's... If you want the pulpit up here. Well, I think I sound like <laughs> annoying enough. Yeah. Um, I would never ask you what books you've published are your favorites, because that's an impossible question. Instead, I'm going to ask each, each of the artists, what are some of the favorite Koyama books that you've read other than your own? And we'll start with that. Oh, um, Diary Comics. <laughs> I'll answer for Ben. Diary Comics. I'll say Diary Comics because that, that, was, that was the first one I read. So that was like, I got that at SPX 2014. Um, and that just kind of like opened up the whole world pretty much um yeah i don't know like it's i forget who was saying it but the koyama books are all just like really well put together like the paper stock and like it's just a nice physical object to hold in your hands um so yeah i don't know the diary comics is good um 
I don't know. There's just so many of them. Any any in particular that, like struck you personally? Or... <clears throat> um, I really liked Patrick's. That was like I think it was the second book I read. It's the one um, distance mover. I think. Oh, yeah. 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 It's got, got the two spot colors on it, mm -hmm. and like I don't know. Like you see spot colors being used in like newspaper comics, but you don't put two and two together that you can do something like that yourself. So that was like, oh yeah, I can give that a shot next time. <clears throat> Patrick, how about you? Um, a book debuting this weekend, Noel Freibert's Old Ground, I'm really, really excited about. I read last week and was just blown away by it. Um, Noel's been making comics for a really long time. Like I discovered his work when I was still in school and he was like a student at um, Micah still. Yeah. And, He's from Baltimore, um, or I think he's from Kentucky originally, but lives in Baltimore now. But yeah, Noel's, um, when I first saw Noel's work, like way back then, um, I realized that I was going to have to like, do something drastic if I was going to keep up with him, because he was just so <laughs> talented. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to see his book um, be published with Annie. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic book. I recommend everyone check it out. <clears throat> Elmer? I'm very glad you asked. I actually have a copy oh. of my favorite book. It's Sex Fantasy by uh, Sophia Foster Dimino. I bought five copies oh, must because I'm going to give it to all of my friends. Um, I only have four friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give them to my four best friends. Um, and it's just, um, I've been, I've already read it in mini comic form. I'm really excited to read it all together. Uh, it's one of the best comics I've ever read in my life. Um, what about it is so affecting for you? Uh, Sophia, just um, I'm I'm a big fan of the type of storytelling that's really polished, uh, um, like carefully constructed. Her her uh, her comics are like little gemstones with little glittering facets. And just uh, the very short and very clean, uh, very clear, and they're exquisite. They're exquisitely crafted and uh, uh, extraordinarily emotional. Um, I've cried and cried reading many of the, the issues. Um, she's a genius. <laughs> That's all. Anyway, so I'm just, I've been so, it's been a bad year. I don't know if any of y'all noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at the news lately. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll catch you up. I'll catch you up later. But literally over the summer, when I was feeling really low, I would think about how Sophia's book was coming out, Aww. and it made me feel a lot better. Thank you for putting it out, Annie. Can I add to that? Have you guys ever seen a kid taste cotton candy for the first time? Like that's I taught at Parsons for a semester, and I showed them Sophia's comics, and that's what their faces look like, like wow. looking at her comics. Like she's just. So amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can this be? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be a copycat, but that's my answer as well. Like the Sophia, we were talking about it in the bar last night. Sophia's comics are so emotionally like dense. Like like Sophia is like sixteen or something. So she's twenty. She's young. <laughs> but it's and I'm forty three and it's like stuff that I'm like, I am years away from understanding everything that's packed into these and I mean in the most pleasant way, like when you read a, like I'm in the middle of Jillian's book right now, Boundless, and Annie and I were talking about this, like you, this is off the subject of Annie's books, but I think she'd approve, like reading Jillian Tamaki's short stories are so, they're so packed with meaning that you can't cruise into the next one, you have to stop, like a good short story and put the book away because your mind is, and sex fantasy, like the one, what's the one where she is, uh, like the girl is over her shoulder talking. It crushed me when I first read it. This one. Do you ever feel bad sometimes? It's like. Show the class. <laughs> this book, this story here, I read it and I was like, this is what comics should be. Like, this is, this is a thing that you can't do in, in another medium. Her weird abstract drawings that you're like, why, why did she make this choice? Like, you're constantly considering the artist. Um, considering what she's saying, considering what it means to you, what it means to her. It's like really dense, pleasurable, uh, harrowing, emotional content that is like, she's, I think she's like 
in the top two or three people working right now, just really amazing. Anne is 16 years old, so <laughs> <laughs> one presumes that she'll get even better, which is pretty exciting. Um, and hearing that my favorite person was publishing my favorite comic was like Eleanor, I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. So. Annie, was that, um, was it, did she approach you, you approach her? It seemed like it would be kind of a no-brainer deal. We talked many years ago. Um, Sophia works slowly, and she's always working on nine million projects, and she doesn't rush and do a shitty quick job at any of them. So when you have an artist like that, and clearly worth waiting for, I can be patient if I want something. I, I, you know, there's one person I'm waiting eight years now for, but you know, they take animation gigs or whatever. You do what you have to to make money in this business because there is none in comics, and so I could never criticize that. And so I'm prepared to wait, and I waited a while for Sophia, and you know richly rewarded, as I knew I would be, from waiting. And Hannah? Um, I think it was at a TCAF many moons ago. Uh, Annie gave me a bunch of Michael DeForge's and Patrick Kyle stuff. And I was like, this is the weirdest stuff I've ever seen. <laughs> um, just mind-blowingly beautiful and strange. And um, I didn't know that comics can be that. So. Um, yeah, that was huge. That was a big moment for me. Um, going back to sort of the beginning, this is um, the first real book you published up on the screen there, uh, Trio Magnus. Oh, yeah. What are your memories of, of publishing that book? Like, what were your expectations as a young publisher? Well, I, as I accidentally fell into publishing, I didn't actually consider myself a publisher when I did that book. That book organically happened uh, with these three illustrators, and I sold my car and sent them to Japan to this big show, shipping 100 copies from China, where the printer was, and I think we sold eight. They were hmm. way too intimidating to a Japanese audience. They were like three Hulk and white guys, so <laughs> it was pretty entertaining, and you know, they liked it. The Japanese people thought it was very funny and were saying they're laughing really a lot and not buying it. So it was, but it was a beautiful book to put together. It's got a belly band, which I hope I never have to do ever again. <laughs> so I mean, I, I didn't know. I, I mean, you don't know. I knew nothing. I knew nothing about how to make a book. So when you're going from zero to 900 in the course of, you know, the production of one book, um, you know, I am a quick learner, but um, it was fun. It was fun partly because we were all so stupid. Um, would I make a book like that now? I do it a little bit different. Um, I stand by that book, and it, it did well. Yeah, and all those three guys have gone on to do uh, kids' books. Um, one is in animation, and one has you know, got a kid and is doing other kids' books, and so they're doing well. It's, it was rewarding. You have an entire panel with Michael tomorrow to I do. Go, over, um, go through memory lane, but I just want to ask you about um, just the uh, you know, what, what urged you to like print, like, like this is like the first comic book you printed. Um, I did Chris Hustle's little uh, craft work mini oh. before that, but yes, this was the first real one. I know, I've seen um, his geek posters, Michael's geek posters online, and they were like, I, f I feel like Hannah seeing Michael and Patrick's work for the first time. It was like, what, what even is this? Like people <laughs> draw like, what? what, what is this? This is so fantastic, and so, we were friends on Facebook, and he happened in, I think, 2008 to walk by my table, the table where I had that one Trio Magnus book. And because, you know, when you're a newbie, they don't know you, they put you between the bathrooms, the shittiest spot, but turned out to be the greatest spot because everyone has to pee over two days. And so we sold books that way. But, and so Michael probably had to pee also because he walked by the table, and I'm like, hey, I recognize you because Pompadour. In those days, he looked quite different than he does now. And so I'm like, Michael. And so, you know, and of course he was a sweet and wonderful, and then very soon after we decided to do Lose One, which Michael now hates to this day, and I'm not allowed to reprint it, which, and I respect that. But um, it's, it's still, you know, out there on eBay. Does it kind of blow your mind to see how, like, astoundingly influential it is, like, over this entire generation of young cartoonists? And old cartoonists. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, it doesn't amaze me because I, I, I expect that of them. I, I know that you know in more subtle ways, um, Patrick has that following. You know, all of everybody here, with the exception of lots of people, still don't know Hannah. But wait, just wait. In two years, she'll be ruling stuff too. Or five. So I'm not surprised that he went that far and he has that Obviously. influence. Um, 
what was really nice is to be a little bit a part of that and to make, have made that happen for him. So, yeah, I, I maintain he would have done well without me, but, you know, if you can speed up an artist's progress like that, it's the best thing in the world. It, it makes up for, you know, not making any money and that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> one of the things I like about um, Climate Press in particular is uh, your, your eye for interesting stories behind the books and in particular, what is obscenity by uh, Rickard and Ashiko is like one of the most fascinating stories of all. Um, tell me, what, what was your experience like in meeting her and what's it like working with her and what was the... Well, um, I have to say that my primary experience was Anne Ishii and Graham Colby bringing this book to me. So I cannot take credit ah. for, um, I didn't discover Rokha Dinashko. I read about her in the news when everybody else read about her and thought she was a badass. But then I never thought, whatever. I wasn't into doing uh, manga stuff. I don't read manga. I'm extremely, to this day, racist. embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very ignorant about it. And so I, I, I don't, it's already, you know, to be a publisher now after having done the hard work for 10 years. But I never wanted to be a publisher. I was a filmmaker before this. Uh, I love documentary film. I still love documentary film, and it's just as hard as comics. So maybe, maybe don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> but that book was brought to me, and I mean, you know, I like a good underdog story. I mean, what better? And she's, what I love about that artist is she's, she's sort of, she's almost guileless. I mean, she keeps, you know, getting punched and falling down. She gets right back up. She's like that clown thing that you hit when you're mm -hmm. little and she just pops right back up and smiles at you. She's nice to the cops and she's like, thank you, I met my husband, you know, who is, you know, the water boy singer because you were mean to me, and, but I thank you very much, <laughs> policeman of Japan. She says this. She now has a kid and she lives in Ireland part-time with him and part-time in Tokyo. So, I mean, she's still fighting stuff. She's always going to fight stuff. She hasn't changed society there. but. She's trying to change society there. And um, I don't know much about Japan, even though I am of that descent. But I do know enough Racist. that it's, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, one person is not gonna change, well, one person's not gonna change what's wrong with that country in terms of how they treat women, sorry. Um, but it's not stopping her from trying, you know? It's, it's, She's a hero, she's a hero. So how could you not love that story? So that's why I took it. But Annie, she, total credit. And, and really, she edited, translated it. I was really the facilitator here. Was she your campaign. first choice? Anne? Yeah. Well, she, or, wait, wait, were you, she were brought you, the book to me, so. Yeah, I mean, rather were you her first choice? Did she think of you as the person, and you know, it's in the North America who would uh, tackle this? I think you'll, you'll have to ask her that, because I don't know, maybe she went to nine other places first, but I, I don't think so, actually. Yeah. yeah. I think she knew what kind of story I like, and that's a no-brainer for me. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor to questions, if we get the mic up, uh, mic, uh, up here. Oh, okay, the mic's back there. If anyone has any questions, the mic is in the back. <laughs> or just yell. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can just walk up to the mic. Uh -huh. <laughs> or you can Don't be yell. shy. They're, re they're recording this, so unfortunately you cannot just yell out. Okay, sorry. Uh, I was just wondering, um, I mean, I'm sure this comes up a lot, but in terms of like paper print uh, publishing, like do you feel that that has changed at all given like electronic um, e-readers and inter like new technological introductions like that? Like how... Has it changed? Do you still feel like it has the same? Like, I still feel like books have the same effect and they're like more personable and things like that. So like, yeah. When I first started, I wanted to do art books. Again, misguided because that year, all the art book stores closed in Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't get grants in Canada to do it. Um, so there's like every door is shut to you if you're doing art books and so, um, but the good serendipitous part of that is like, look where I ended up doing, because I get to do art books of a sort, but even with more. So um, that was cool. I, I maintain that you will always, like, paper is, tablets are great, whatever, fun, games, whatever. Um, 
I spend a lot of time on my screen personally. I don't want to read stuff on you know my iPad afterwards. Yeah. So the other thing is the kinds of books I do. Um, there's a visual component to it. Um, as much as possible, I give the artist what they would like in terms of fancy covers, fancy interior paper. Uh, you may, I've had people pick up books with the cartoon paper that we use, and some of them like Patrick's books, actually, and they go, oh, this paper's really cheap. Oh, not in a bad way, and I'm, but I'm like, actually, it's more expensive to use the <laughs> paper that feels cheap to you, but it gives you that effect and um, takes you down memory lane that way. So I really have faith that you know people are still going to want print books, mm -hmm. unwavering. Um, and I think I've been proven right because the ebook industry is not it didn't go where it was supposed to go and rob us of everything. Mm -hmm. So you know, sorry trees, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah. you know, sorry environment. Well, but I have found that, like, I mean, I'm sure there's, like, recyclable paper and stuff, substitutions like that, but I have found that, like, especially with, like, emerging artists who are doing comics and other books like that, like, they have these new ways of working with their paper that, like, just doesn't happen a lot mm -hmm. in, like, mainstream or can't happen in e-readers. So, like, those new ways of doing, like, leaf, I don't know, like, fly leaves that are bent over French covers or something like that, like... So, I mean, I guess, like, is there a flexibility with that that you find? It's, uh, it's not an option for me. I, I want to make book books until I can't. Um, we do sell a lot of our titles uh, via Comixology. I held out for many, many years, and I'm still grumpy about it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't want to deny a small income source to my artists if they want to go that way. Yeah. And so that's why I caved in the end. Not all of our artists choose to be on that platform, and that's totally fine with me. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but um, it's not even a choice for me, mm -hmm. so probably I'm the wrong person to ask. Yeah, well, de <laughs> well definitely, yeah. It's like cool new stuff that people do with paper, so I don't know. Thank you, though. <laughs> You're welcome. Anyone else? Yes. How's everybody doing? Great. Good, thank you. Good, pretty um, good. I just wanted to thank you guys for doing this panel. I appreciate it. I'm sure everyone does. Um, Thank you for being here. I have a two-part question. Oh, can I adjust this? No? All right. Um, <laughs> what advice do you have for uh, novice comic book writers, um, not an artist, just a writer, and um, how do you find a balance um, be as a creative uh, person, anybody, uh, between um, telling stories that you really want to get up to tell and write uh, versus what you think people are going to like and respond to uh, for a more general audience? To me or to the artists? Um, I think that might be a good one for the artists. Yeah, yeah but from, from a writing standpoint, please. I don't think you should make anything if you are only making it for other people. So if that's your goal, then don't, don't do it. <laughs> um, in terms of like how to improve your writing, I think it's a good idea to look outside of cartoony and comics. And I know it's kind of dirty to say like real books, but read. I think reading novels is really beneficial. I've been trying to read a lot more recently, and I think it's been really helpful for my writing. Um, Anyone else? I I feel uh, like my job when I draw a comic is to take something that I want to write about, I want to draw, and make the reader interested in it and make the reader respond to it. Uh, that's, that's always the goal. Um, I really want to, if I've had a feeling that I want to communicate, I want the reader to feel that feeling um, and then hopefully it would be just as important to them as it was to me. Um, so I guess maybe combining the two things. I agree with Patrick that there's, you're not going to make anything good ever <laughs> if it's not what is, you know, in here. Yeah. Um, but also I do think s there's a certain kind of artist that is uh, comfortable with, you know, taking what's inside them and presenting it and not really worrying too much about if it's interpretable or not, uh, which is fine. I, I love a lot of work like that, um, and it's vital. But uh, but it's a 
for myself, I think it's a, um, a goal to, to figure out how to make it translate. Yeah, I feel exactly the same. Like the, if I am worried about how something comes off, um, then I'm usually doing the wrong thing. Like all the art that I enjoy looking at and making is, especially if I'm doing something that is tough for me or a thing I don't understand in the process of folding that thing up, that feeling, and saying, I feel this way, right? And then taking that somehow folding into a shape that if I hand it to Eleanor and she unfolds it, the act of unfolding it, this filthy thing I was cleaning my glasses with, she <laughs> gets the feeling. Yeah, it says you're racist on it. <laughs> Sometimes people need to be told by a white man <laughs> racist, okay? Um, Thank you for your bravery. You're right. <laughs> Hashtag not on that. But the, like Patrick says, if you're making something for that it'll sell or for a perceived audience, that's fine, that's like day job stuff, but it's not art. It can be artful, but it, it is not. I mean, maybe I have a, a, a puerile idea of art, but it feels like a struggle is necessary or you're just kind of jacking off. Also, you're just working against, it's, you're, it's less likely to be good. You're working yeah. against what you've, your biggest asset, yeah, which like, is actually, you know. Your heart. Your heart. Yeah. Your heart is your biggest asset. Yeah, and it's your biggest um, heart. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to leave me with that. <laughs> um, yes, and. <laughs> oh, great. Let's not do improv. Uh, yeah, I agree with these guys. Um, I'm in the process of outlining... Um, some, I guess they're autobio comics, and a lot of them are derived from my journal, um, which is just a Google Doc. And um, when trying to tell the story through other characters, I found it to be really hard. Um, it just didn't feel real, and it wasn't coming from here. Um, so it, it is really important to have a personal connection with your work so that your audience can as well. Oh, and if you're writing comics, you should take up drawing. can only make you a better comics writer. Just even if you never show anyone, I think drawing would be the best possible thing you could do. That's actually really good advice. Yeah. Unlike the rest of the garbage <laughs> dust. <laughs> I'm being a racist right now. A little bit of a worst racist. The worst kind of racist. Oh, and I just want to say that you don't have to draw well. You don't have to be a trained... Right. artist or illustrator or anything like that. Um, what's most important is that you're being authentic. And to be honest, um, I personally find really overtrained work a little bit boring. Um, like super commercial, like, you know, stuff that you would see in a, like an advertising program at an art, art school or something like that. So the weirder the better. Thanks. Um, that's all the time we have for questions. And uh, we're actually going to wrap up the panel. But I just wanted to say that um, personally, as a, as a critic and person who's been following independent comics for a long time, I have to say that Annie and Claremont Press represent the best of what is possible in comics, um, both in terms of the heart in which she puts and the belief she puts in what she publishes, as well as the way she makes everything better around her. And it's, um, it's a pleasure and an honor to know and have worked with her over the years. Thank you very much. Thanks for attending. Thank you.